they're all good reasons to be thankful. But I want to give you a better one this morning. Better than all of these. God told us to be thankful. That's all we need, isn't it? See, so there's nowhere that I can think of in the Bible where the Bible says, be thankful because if you're thankful, you'll receive all these benefits. I'm not denying the beneficial. I'm just saying the Bible doesn't list the benefits. Because all the Bible has to say is be thankful. If God tells us to be thankful, and He's a loving God, who loved us so much that Christ died for us on the cross of Calvary, then being thankful must be good for us. And for no, for no other reason, being thankful is certainly just simply good because, well, it's a matter of obedience. It is said that there's 138 passages of Scripture that deal with the subject of thanksgiving. 138, according to Larry Poland in his book, Thanksgiving More Than Turkey Day, published back in 1983. We're going to look at one of these passages this morning, Psalm 100, as I already mentioned. And in Psalm 100, what you're going to find is this. In Psalm 100, we are told to be thankful seven times in these five short verses. They're all imperative verbs in the Hebrew. They're commands. The psalmist is saying, and the Lord is saying through him, be thankful, be thankful, be thankful, over and over and over again. It's emphasized in poetic language and with various other facts woven into it as to the details. God wants us to be thankful. But there's something else I noticed in Psalm 100. There is this emphasis on both passionate and purposeful thanksgiving. Psalms always deals with the emotional part of life as well as the practical part of life. Well, I don't know if every psalm does, but, I, but, but psalms are about life, the bottom line for all of us. And so I want to take the first two points this morning in the message and just kind of label them passionate, passionate thanksgiving. But then when we get to points three and four, we're going to move into what I would call purposeful thanksgiving. Because God's desire is for us to be thankful, but He wants our thanksgiving to be both passionate and purposeful. So let's look at these this morning, beginning with the first one. We need to, according to verses 1 and 2, be thankful with a joyful heart. Be thankful with a joyful heart. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. That's verse 1, the first part of verse 2. You might be more familiar with the terminology, make a joyful noise to the Lord. I think that might be the King James translation. I'm reading the New King James. The Hebrew word here translated shout or noise is more than just the use of your voice. It, the word indicates probably what you hear, be it vocal or instrumental. And the Psalms, of course, uh, uh, mention much or say much about the instrumental part of worship as well as the vocal. In fact, in Psalm 150, Verses 3 to 5, you'll find listed there stringed instruments, percussion instruments, and wind instruments, all covered. And that's a great psalm as well about worship, Psalm 150. So we are to make a joyful noise, be it vocal, be it instrumental. Now those of us who don't sing so well, we, you know, we like to emphasize make a joyful noise because we don't think we're so uh, lovely as far as the sound we make, but uh, just combine the noise of some of us with the nice instrumentation and the, the leadership uh, that we have in worship and from those who can sing, and it's a beautiful, wonderful 
experience. We should enjoy our worship. We should be lifted up and encouraged by our worship. And then notice in verse 2, not only are we to serve the Lord in gladness with a joyful heart, making a joyful sound, but it says serve the Lord with gladness. So the second aspect of joyful worship is this matter of serving with gladness. Serving. The Old Testament priest served in the tabernacle, or they served in the temple, which meant that they were there to receive the sacrificial animals and and do all those things which were required of the priesthood, which stood between the people and God. Now, we are very fortunate in this dispensation that we do not any longer need priests. Please uh, do not uh, think of uh, the pastor in any sense as being the priest. I once year, very early in my ministry went to visit and a lady in the nursing home that uh, did not get out of there, obviously, and uh, she, she had had, uh, she was pretty well off physically, but her mind wasn't good. And, uh, but somehow she recognized me, and as soon as I, I walked in the door, she began shouting, The priest is here! The priest is here! All the, I mean, just shouting as loud as she could. And, uh, you know, what do you do? You know, I'm, I'm not a priest, believe me. But uh, some people may think that I am. The truth of the matter is, in the New Testament, the Bible teaches us that we're all priests. Every believer is his own priest. Meaning we have direct access to God in prayer. We don't have to go for somebody to pray for us. We don't have to go through a priest or a mediator. Jesus Christ is the only mediator between us and God the Father. And when that temple veil was rent from top to bottom, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, we have then from that point forward an open and intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course that is achieved in a much uh, practical regard through the Spirit of God which indwells our hearts. So we serve, we bring our own worship to God without hindrance. We don't need someone to receive our sacrifice. We don't need someone to pronounce this or that or pray for us. In fact, in the New Testament, we see some very interesting verses that will help us. The first is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. Therefore, by Him, that is Jesus Christ, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. When we bring thanksgiving to God, it is in a sense the same thing as they were doing in the Old Testament when the Old Testament worshiper would bring a sacrificial animal to God, which was a thanksgiving for God's blessing in their life. Some sacrifices, obviously, the Old Testament were specified by law. Some were uh, just ways that people could personally worship God, a thank offering, or uh, uh, come to God with a free will offering. Those things they could do when they wanted, as they wanted. But we can always bring our thankfulness to God in a similar way. And this is what God wants from us. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, talks about our giving. Now, on the first day of the week, let each one of you, says Paul, lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. In other words, as God may prosper us, and we then have ability, we of our free will bring and give. That there be no collections, Paul says, when I come. So we not only bring a sacrifice of praise, but we give free will offerings to God out of love and thankfulness for all that He has done for us. And then Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. So we not only bring our own sacrifices of praise, we not only bring our own free will offerings and the gifts that we give, but we literally encourage and exhort one another and lift others up and utilize our spiritual gifts within the body of Christ 
to make our experience together in worship a very vital and wonderful thing. Serve Him with gladness. What joy that should bring our hearts when we're able to worship Him in this fashion. Then finally, we read here in uh, verse 2 also, it's this uh, final uh, thought. He says, Come before His presence with singing. Whereas the earlier word, earlier Hebrew word translated shout or noise incorporates any, any sound, he specifically identifies singing now uh, as part of our worship. Come into his presence with singing. Singing is always associated with joy. And this is how, now think about this, this is how the world without Christ perverts things. You know, you know, you've heard the, the joke about the old country song, you know, you play it backwards, you know, and you get your wife back and you quit drinking and, you know, and all those things, you know. Because the, the world tends to sing about things that uh, are not joyful. There's a whole class of music called the blues, you know. But in the church, we sang praises to God from a joyful heart. We enter into His presence with joyful singing. Because He is the one who blesses us. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 uh, come into mind here, where the Bible says that uh, one of the results of being Spirit-filled is to be speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. God wants us to be joyful. He wants us to rejoice. And we have that privilege and that honor when we thank Him, when we are thankful, when we are grateful people. Now consider the importance of thanksgiving for a moment with me. Would you uh, just do this little exercise with me in your mind? Here's a, here's a sentence with a blank in it, and I want you to fill in the blank. The sentence is, we cannot be blank and be thankful. Now everybody come up with at least one word to go in there. I cannot be blank and be thankful. This is just common sense stuff, okay? Can you put a word in there? I cannot be blank and be thankful. I came up with a bunch. Of course, I had a lot more time to work on it than you did. But I, I, I came up with a good list here. I cannot be sad and unhappy and be thankful. Now, I, I understand. Sometimes, you know, we, we have problems and that bear on our mind and tragedies that come in and we're sad and at the same time we're thankful as well. I understand that. But I generally just in a common sense everyday type of mood or, or uh, uh, you know, emotion, if, if I go around just, you know, dwelling on all the things that make me unhappy and what I'm, you know, don't like, then I'm not being thankful. Uh, I cannot be disappointed and be thankful. If I'm disappointed, then I'm, I'm questioning God's goodness. Uh, now, we can be disappointed, but uh, then that's probably because our desires are not maybe where they should be. I cannot be hopeless and be thankful. If I'm hopeless, then God can't do anything about my, my needs and my life. Uh, what is there to be thankful about? I can't be self-centered and self-serving and be thankful because I'm not looking to God to do anything that I for me that I need. I can't feel entitled and be thankful. I cannot be bitter and angry and be thankful. I cannot be jealous and envious and be thankful. I can't even be impatient and be thankful. They, the two don't go together. I can't be overly critical or complaining or irritable or grumbling or out of God's will and be thankful. I can't be indifferent to the world and be thankful. I can't be overly worried about things and be thankful. I certainly can't be unbelieving or faithless and be thankful. I mean, the list just could go on endlessly. God wants us to be thankful. Again, all of these seven verbs that we see here in Psalm 100 are in the imperative mode. They are commands. God is telling us, yes, be thankful. So, be thankful with a joyful heart, number one. And then number two, be thankful with full assurance. Be thankful with full assurance. Verse 3, know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. 
No, from right from the beginning of verse 3, we see that this is talking about something that we need to be assured of. Know that the Lord, He is God. Now, the word translated Lord, Yahweh, in the Hebrew, uh, it's usually represented by four capital letters, L-O-R-D in the Old Testament. And the word, that name of God, re references His eternality, His self-existent. He always was, He always will be. But the Lord, it says, know that the Lord, He is God. And that second name of God, translated G-O-D, is the Hebrew word Elohim, which means all-powerful God, the Creator God. So he is the God who always was and always will be. He is the ever-existent one. He is, he is Yahweh, but he is also the creator God, the all-powerful God. And so uh, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. Boy, is that not a message that the world needs today? The world is existing by and large in unbelief without any understanding of who they are or where they come from or where they're going. That's why they're referred to as those that are lost. The science and uh, those who are supposedly uh, smarter than us Christians, uh, they know that they just happen somehow. <laughs> No, know that the Lord, He is God, the all-powerful Elohim, the Creator God. It is He who made us, and not we ourselves. You see, a man has created and concocted an idea that uh, he say, somehow came about or came into being in and of himself without God. And so God is denied, there is no God. But He is our Creator nonetheless, and no matter what you believe or convince yourself of, every creation of God will stand before God and give an account to God. Because we belong to Him. He created us, and we are His. He made us, He made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. So, if He is not God, if He is not the Creator, uh, then we are not the work of His hands, and there's no point in being thankful. Right? Who are you being thankful to? So, this is the passionate part of our thanksgiving. Be thankful with a joyful heart. Be thankful with full assurance. But let's move into purposeful thanksgiving now. The third thing we learn here about being thankful is this. We need to be thankful in a place of worship. We need to be thankful in a place of worship. Now, please understand, I'm not saying that we should not be thankful elsewhere. We should. Uh, we should, in fact, be thankful all the time. Thanksgiving should characterize our very life and our very existence. But it is also of extreme importance to be thankful in a place of worship. Verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Now, the gates and the courts refer to the tabernacle, and then later on in the Old Testament history, the temple. You had to go through the gate to get into the courtyard, and then you, you would go to the, the next courtyard and so on. They had a a courtyard for the Gentiles, a courtyard for the women, a courtyard for the men, and eventually uh, a courtyard where only the priests could be. And then eventually the holy place uh, and then the holy of holies where only the high priest could enter once a year. So there was m more limited uh, participation coming into the presence of God. But we're talking about coming into His presence because in the Old Testament, God dwelt on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies in the far back side or back end of the tabernacle. So he says, come into his presence. Because, because the, in the tabernacle, in the temple, God dwelt there. Now, of course, God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. But there's a particular aspect of his uh, presence there in that tabernacle. 
So enter into his gates with praise and into his courts with praise, into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So there was something in the Old Testament important about coming to worship in the tabernacle or the temple. Now, uh, they lived all over a large expanse of land. They did not have automobiles or other uh, modern transportation. So it wasn't a matter that every Jew came to the tabernacle every Saturday. But there were certain festivals and times of the year when they were all called to come. To come in to worship at that place. You remember when Jesus came to Jerusalem with Mary and Joseph and he was young, uh, you maybe about around 12, and uh, he, he reasoned with the rabbis there, the Pharisees and all, and everybody was amazed. And, and then they went home and uh, suddenly he wasn't with you know, either Joseph or Mary, and they went back and found him there reasoning with the, the religious leaders and so on. Why were they there? They were coming to Jerusalem at one of those times of the year when they were commanded to come and worship. So coming into his gates, coming into his courts, was coming to a place of worship in obedience to the command of God. Now we have a similar uh, responsibility. We are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We saw that in Hebrews 10.25 just a few moments ago. That doesn't mean we have to come every week and if we don't, you know, if we're not there uh, on Sunday, uh, you know, the Lord's not happy with us. Uh, he may be unhappy with us depending on the situation, but, you know, Hebrews 10.25 is not talking about you have to be there every week. We could be sick, we could be out of town, you know, there's, there's things like that. I, I think probably you have crossed the line when you go to the beach every Sunday and you're not in the Lord's house. So, uh, you know, but don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, is the manner of some end. There's something special about coming into this place and worshiping together with brothers and sisters. I can come in here on Sunday morning and I may have had a, 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 a week that is, you know, forgettable. You know, I just, you know, one of those weeks where everything seemed to go wrong. And uh, you just get in a, a bad mood on Monday and you can't get rid of it. You ever had that happen? Of course you have. <laughs> Maybe not as much as me, but you do. You know what I'm talking about. So uh, I, I can walk in in, in, a, in a kind of a down frame of mind and we begin singing together and praising God. And I'll immediately, immediately sense a difference in my spirit. It lifts you up. It gives you encouragement. It's, it's kind of like, you know, I was coming to church this morning and I'm driving down the road and these new cars, they got, you know, these days they got all kind of contraptions on. And all of a sudden, something like beep, 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 beep. Go, what is going on? I look down the, on my dashboard and it says, your tire pressure is low. Okay, okay it's three pounds low or something. You know, I'm like, why bother me for that? You know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's this matter of, being where we should be, doing what we should be doing on a regular basis. And, you know, there should be some alarms going off if uh, for some reason that's not taking place in your life. Be thankful in a place of worship, a symbol for worship there with others. Come into his gates. And then notice the latter part of verse 4. It says, be thankful to him and bless his name. So uh, we recognize that God is the author of all good things that happen to us. That He is the author of our blessings. And we, we deserve, He deserves our praise and our thanksgiving. And, and that just lifts us up. And uh, it, it, it gives us something that we need to get us through the next week. It's kind of like, you know, that alarm goes off and that tire pressure is low. What do I need to do? I need to go put some air in the tire. So it won't be beeping at me next week. So church on Sunday is kind of, you know, it, it, it kind of reinflates us spiritually and enables us, and God designed that into His plan. Now, it says, be thankful to Him and bless His name. So that means, to, you know, it's not just bless God. That's okay to say that. That's a great thing to say. But most people have no idea what you're saying. The term bless here means to speak well of God, to praise His name. 
to thank Him, to extol Him. It's not just saying, bless God. Oh, that's fine to say that if you understand what you're saying. But there's more to it than just saying that word. He is worthy of our praise and thanksgiving. If it was not for His praiseworthy character, we would have no reason to be thankful. If He wasn't a praiseworthy character, then it would be no different if God happened to bless us from taking a $100 bill from somebody that just robbed a bank to get it. You know, but God is God, and He is perfect, and, and uh, He deserves our, our praise, and He's worthy of it all. So be thankful in a place of worship, and then finally, under this heading of purposeful worship, be thankful for specific reasons. And He gives us three specific reasons in verse 5. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. So the Lord is good. There was a, I've been racking my brain all morning trying to think of a, a Christian film was out a few years ago where the characters kept saying, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. Some of you remember that one? I can't, I can't remember the name of the, of the thing. But uh, the first person would say, and it would be two people, the first person would say, God is good, and the second person would answer, all the time. And then the person who said all the time would repeat and say, all the time, and the other guy would say, God is good. Well, that is that's kind of profound <laughs> when you think about it. You know, God is good. He's not good part of the time. He's good all the time. He is good. He is the essence of goodness. He doesn't do anything or allow anything into our life that is not good. That's why Paul can write, for all things work together for good. See, not everything in this life is good. And even the bad things that God allows us to experience, He allows us to experience and uh, in, in that whole process we mature and something good comes out of that in our life. God is good. His mercy is everlasting. Now here the word mercy literally means His faithfulness to us. You can depend on God. Uh, he, you, you don't have to wonder, is God going to take care of me? Is God going to uh, be with me? Is God going to help me? God is a merciful God, and His mercy is always there. His mercy is everlasting. And then His truth endures to all generations. His truth endures to all generations. Now, that means His truth is always available to all generations. It does not mean that every generation accepts His truth. In fact, we live in a generation where God's truth is scorned. God's truth is made fun of. God's truth is thought to be, well, unworthy of somebody who is enlightened, and somebody who knows how things really are. And, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, science has all the answers. Hey, science can't even make up its mind about this virus. Science has been tr trying for how many months to tell us what to do, and, and you can read every, every opinion under the sun or what you should do and how you should act. The best you can do is, you know, do what you think is, is the best for you. But there's no absolute consensus. Uh, even, even the vaccine, and I praise God that that's been uh, developed, and, and I think that's a blessing of God in itself. Uh, and vaccines are wonderful, and they're, you know, 95% effective. That's great. But unless you're in the 5%, then it really doesn't matter a whole lot. See, God's in control. Now, God's truth is never a matter of science. Science arrives at what they believe is truth through tests and experiments and consideration of this, that, and the other. And it, it employs human reasoning, but it is not God's truth. Now, if, if science determines something is true and it's God's truth, then that's, that's great. I mean, you, it's pretty easy to determine some things. You know, you can determine that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Well, we used to, anyway. I'm not sure they can anymore. But, uh, you know, some things seemingly are self-evident. But without God as the anchor to your truth, you were always going to have a problem. <laughs> uh, you know... 
we have gotten used to the terminology or the expression, <clears throat> the war on Christmas. You know, when it's, you know, it's about ready to heat up right about now. You know, how you, you can't go into a place of business and, you know, the, the cashiers can't say, Merry Christmas. They can't help what, you know, they can't stop you from saying what you want to say. But, you know, you work here, you can't say Merry Christmas. And there's all this pressure, you know, really, we don't, you know. We, why is that so important, by the way? Because there are those who want to push Christianity into the corner over here and keep it secret and covered up and keep us intimidated. By the way, do you know there's a war on Thanksgiving? You see, that's a little bit more subtle, but we are fighting that one too. For example, the American Civil Liberties Union has come out and said that America was founded on white supremacy. Now, what does that have to do with Thanksgiving? I'm about to tell you. Hang on. Because this is the way they think, this convoluted way they, they come up with things. Well, what does white supremacy have to do with Thanksgiving? Well, the, the idea is the pilgrims were white supremacists. Where did they get that? They made it up. It's called rewriting history. Because you've got to rewrite history and make America evil all the way back to its formation before you can convince people that they ought to embrace the one world order that's on the horizon. In fact, a professor at George Washington University, a man by the name of David Silverman, has let it be known that he thinks that it's wrong historically to believe the pilgrims came to America for the purpose of religious freedom and self-government. No, he said they just came here to make money. And the way they were going to make money is they were going to steal it off the Indians. That's a rich, that was a rich bunch of people back then, evidently. I don't know. Uh, they, were, they were rich in their own culture. I don't know what they would have had that the Europeans would have wanted. He even, he even goes so far as to say that Thanksgiving the holiday, and the first Thanksgiving that we look back on, was not Thanksgiving given to God, but it was a feast they had out of joy that they had hoodwinked the Indians and made a deal with them so that they could have what they need to survive. Completely rewriting the history of it. You'll find this, no doubt, in textbooks. Now the Puritans were, excuse me, the pilgrims were separatists. They wanted free from the tyrannical Church of England. They wanted free from the King of England, who was a tyrant. And they first fled to Holland, and then they came to America. Now, when they were in Holland, they contracted the London Company to have the right under the king to come to America and start a colony. Now, the London Company was all about profit. But here's the thing. The pilgrims weren't shipmakers. The pilgrims weren't navigators. They couldn't have gotten here on a rowboat if they just, you know, decided to go to America, just hop into the rowboat and let's go. They needed someone to bring them here, so they had to contract with the London Company to get them here. But they always came here for the same reason they had left England in the first place and went to Holland, because they wanted religious freedom. But there are those today who rewrite history and it's all a part of moving this nation, and it's worldwide at this point, and it's this juncture, juncture, to move us all into this attitude of a worldwide government. Now, I'm not saying that that means Jesus is coming tomorrow and, and uh, the Antichrist is over the next hill. But he could be. It could be. All I'm saying is that it's just time and history marches on, we're more and more prepared in our hearts and minds for this. Because... His truth is rejected. It doesn't mean that His truth isn't available. It endures to all generations, and there will always be some of us who believe the Word of God and live by it. 
but many it will be that reject it. And here's what we need to understand and draw from this. Because this is kind of a, you know, I'm not going to send you home on a drabbed, <laughs> discouraged <laughs> type of feeling, okay? And here's what I get from this. If it's so important, if it is so important within the satanic world system that we live, for Satan to want to take away a holiday such as Thanksgiving and relegate it to, well, we all misunderstood it from the start. If it's so important for Satan to do something like that, then our Thanksgiving must be really important. It is our Thanksgiving that separates us and, and allows us to be the light in this world. Our thanksgiving that we bring into the God's house when we gather together. But a thanksgiving that becomes a part of our everyday existence and our every moment life. How many times have you... I don't know, we all do this. Probably you think about it. You, you know, you, you, you just something happens and you just avoid an accident. I don't know about you. The first thing that comes to my lips is, thank you, Lord. If something really good happens... Doesn't it cross your mind? Don't you make that? Thank God. Thanksgiving is so a part of who we are and what we do and how we think and how we respond. It's crucial for the sheep of His pasture. So when we feel the pressure from outside, when we feel the condemnation, when we feel like people want to m move Christianity off of the stage of humanity, it's kind of like that old saying we've all used from time to time, you know. Something must be right in my life or the devil wouldn't be bothering me near as much as he does, you know. That's kind of the, the way we need to look at this. So praise God that we can thank and serve him and worship him.